Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this panel on increasing accessibility in the disabled uh, community. My name is Marion Jones. I'm the Bronx organizer at Transportation Alternatives. Um, so uh, advocates and community leaders have long known that city's youngest, oldest, and most vulnerable street users are dis disproportionately affected by unfriendly design that leads to injuries and fatalities. In this session, we'll hear from advocates that inspired and demand change, uh, which resulted in breaking through to City Hall and, and, and enacting change that leads to streets becoming more accessible. Um, we're joined here by John Ross Brizzo of NYU Plan Gone Health, Di uh, Daniela Aragani of AARP, and Susan Doha, the Executive Director of the Center for Independence of the Dis Disabled. Uh, John, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings from NYU. Really happy to be here. Thank you so much for the, uh, the introduction and the opportunity to speak to you all. And thanks to all my co-speakers for all the wonderful work they've done within this space. Uh, so J.R. Rizzo here from NYU uh, Grossman School of Medicine and also the Tandon School of Engineering. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about my background and some of the work we're doing here uh, at NYU. Um, so I am, I am a physician uh, by background. Uh, my specialty is physical medicine rehabilitation, so disability medicine. Um, I do hold an active medical license uh, in PM&R. Um, but I also trained as a scientist, having completed fellowships at the National Institutes of Health and then also at our Clinical and Translational Science Institute here at uh, NYU. Um, and then most importantly for this panel, I'm a consumer. Um, so I'm legally blind presently. I've been legally blind for about 20 years. Um, I was born uh, with a retinal dystrophy called choroideremia. Um, and so I've watched uh, my peripheral field basically degenerate over the last 35 years or so. I have about two degrees of central vision, so enough to make me dangerous, as I say, in both good and sometimes bad ways. And I like to consider myself, I guess, most importantly, as a steward of New York City. Um, I direct labs and an innovation division here at NYU School of Medicine that supports the creation and development of tools to improve access at greater scale. Um, and we work on full spectrum tools from low tech, so things like mobile technology, uh, to high tech, so things like advanced wearables, and instrumented book bags with really cool stereoscopic camera systems um, that feature cutting edge approaches um, for all types of microservices. Um, so to give you a sense of some of the things that we're working on, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of 51 varieties of Ben and Jerry's ice cream in terms of our microservices. I figured I'd talk about a few. Um, we have some really cool new GPS solutions that we're working on for improved accessibility. Um, one is what's called 3DMA GNSS, which you may have read in some articles or seen on some, and seen on some cool magazines. So this stands for 3D Mapping Aided Global Navigation Satellite Systems. And this is basically building geometry meets satellite visibility. So whereas in most cities, we suffer from the urban canyon and we all know, and when we hail Ubers, uh, it's very frustrating when our cars are jumping back and forth and we're trying to figure out where our car is uh, when we hail some of those services. Rather than suffering from that urban canyon, we take advantage of it and we can figure out where the reflectance patterns of those satellite signals are by taking um, basically maps and understanding the surface topography of New York City and then figuring out those reflectance patterns, um, creating candidate locations and then isolating where you are um, in the city with much better accuracy. Um, we also do very unique things um, uh, within um, uh, camera-based technologies, something called uh, vision place recognition. Um, and this is really cool. We take basically cameras and phones, we acquire images, we reduce them to line drawings, and then we create these special mapping databases. And then we could take your same mo mobile technology, we take the camera feed from that phone, and then we match it for, for localization. So this leverages artificial intelligence, and this really cool, unique detection capability that matches edges and environments with these mapping databases that we've created. And we can do much better than existing GPS in terms of localization. And what's nice about it is we can also pull orientation from it. So we can tell you actually where you're headed, which is very useful for people um, who are disabled, particularly those with visual disability. Um, we do things within the adaptive video coding space. So a lot of people are talking about using machine vision to improve accessibility. But what's really interesting about that is as we were able to take higher resolution images, it's very computationally expensive to handle those images. So we have to come up with adaptive techniques to figure out how we do that, both spatially in terms of image resolution, 
also in terms of temporal, in terms of frame rate, and then lastly, in terms of what we call amplitude or quantization. And we're trying to figure out how to handle that adaptively through algorithms. Um, we're creating fun things, um, or at least we consider them fun, in terms of network policies that optimize their connection opportunities. So for example, Link NYC and public Wi-Fi. So can we use satellite signal buttressed by public Wi-Fi? And then also have um, cloud computing capabilities and, and how do we create genie policies to figure out what do we take advantage of to maximize um, you know, the time to process um, you know, something uh, required to improve, act, um, to improve accessibility, whether that's a high resolution image that we can then analyze with some neural net to say, here's an obstacle and you need to avoid that um, or something else. Um, you know, this is really important uh, in, in terms of maximizing safety. Um, and then we're, we're, we're also working on how to improve the architecture of some of these neural nets uh, to improve both the, both the detection and recognition capabilities to make sure that we can really get those objects of interest um, to those who need it most. So uh, improving things like commuting, um, et cetera. So I think in conclusion, I don't want to put you all to, sleep, all to sleep. I just wanted to give you a quick sense of, you know, the types of work that we're doing. You know, we advocate for strong solutions from low to high tech to disrupt inaccessible gaps in our current city footprint, really improving access for all. So hopefully that gives you um, a little bit of a sense of what we're working on. And I'm happy to take any questions on any of those topics. So I'll throw it back to my co-speakers. So thanks so much for your interest. Thanks, John. Really appreciate that. Um, Danielle. Yeah, hi. Um, should I log into the full presentation or just do quick intros? A full presentation. Fantastic. Well, again, uh, thanks so much for having me. I apologize. I was a little late. I, I was on a call I couldn't get off of. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up some slides just to guide our conversation. Um, and again, thanks to uh, to the rest of the panelists for, um, for, uh, for joining this conversation today. Again, happy to be here. Um, so I'm Daniela Rigoni, I'm with uh, AARP, Director of Livable Communities uh, for that organization. And I wanna quickly sort of walk through a little bit about some of the ways in which we can support advocacy for increased accessibility uh, for all people really. Um, so this is kind of our driving uh, data point, if you will. We are rapidly aging as a country, that's no surprise to anyone, everyone's aging individually, but as a country, we're actually reaching a point very soon uh, in 2034 when we are comprised more as a country of people over 65 than we will be of people under 18. That's the first time that will have been the case in our country's history. And that really begs the question, are we ready as a nation, as communities for that demographic future? Arguably, we're not. Um, we're looking at the fact that in housing, we are ill-suited uh, and, and not providing the kind of housing solutions that people require either from an affordability standpoint or from a um, design standpoint, we know that there's a, a huge uh, gap in the amount of uh, housing that includes accessibility features. Um, we're also just not designing the right size of housing, frankly. Um, when you think about parks and public spaces, again, there's a mismatch. We're not designing places that bring older adults into them um, in ways that, that you would expect as their relative share of the population. And we know that parks are not designed equitably, they're not distributed equitably. And it has very real implications um, from an environmental, from a health standpoint for, for residents in that area, in those areas. Transportation is of course key, now, and we'll all get into that a little bit more here. And I know that's the heart and soul of transportation alternatives. Um, you know, we know that older adults outlive their abilities to drive by anywhere from seven to 10 years. And uh, in a day and age when transit funding is in crisis and when bike and pet fatalities are on the rise, it, it, it begs the question, are there viable alternatives for older adults when they can no longer drive? And frankly, all of these built environment features really roll up to and contribute to a sense of increased loneliness um, and isolation in older adults that has very real physical and mental health effects. Um, so what are some of the sort of roadblocks to these age-friendly communities as we like to think of them? These are places that when they're done well, they are serving the needs of people of all ages. So there, there are a number of roadblocks that we see from our vantage point. First of all, there's a, there's a lack of options for when people stop driving and there's unequal access to quality transit, to une, unequal access to safe bike and ped environments and other solutions. As I mentioned, we have a public transit system that's in crisis and yet it is the lifeline for many older adults and people with disabilities. Um, overall, we see that bike and ped fatalities are, are increasing and that older adults just represent a disproportionate share of those in 35 states. And of course, as yet another layer to this, COVID introduced a whole nother set of barriers, frankly, 
um, to accessing um, transportation alternatives on the, from the perspective of older adults. So what are some of the things that we can do about that? Well, there's a few, there's quite a few actually. I mean, I think we all would agree and, and I know that a report came out earlier this week from uh, about our infrastructure and how we're failing uh, basically as a country in terms of providing adequate infrastructure, but there's a need to clearly invest in better and more infrastructure, which includes safer bike and ped uh, resources, better public transit, better lighting, better signage, better road maintenance. We can work harder to ensure that existing infrastructure meets the needs of all, um, that schedules and destinations match the needs of those it's trying to serve, that payments and discounts are easy, particularly for older adults, uh, and that crosswalk signal timing and, and crosswalks themselves are, are visible and clear and, and doing what they need to be doing. Um, there's a role to educate older adults on using these options as well. I think uh, you know, it's, it's tough to, um, to learn how to use public transit if you've never had to before, or perhaps it's been decades since an older adult's been on a bike or maybe never had, but a little education goes a long way in terms of demonstrating how alternatives can in fact be very important and viable transportation solutions. And at the root of it all really is this desire, as you'll hear, from our perspective to engage older adults in planning as well as implementation. So the way that we go about that is, 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 a few, is in a few different ways. I and mean, certainly at our roots, what we are trying to do is support local leaders and communities to think differently about their housing, transportation, and public spaces to create places that work for people of all ages. We offer a framework for doing that, which I'll talk through quickly. Grants, uh, which are open now, so I, that piques your interest. There's money on the table to be had. We have a number of tools and resources for local leaders. And one thing I wanna drive home here um, assuming there's a, a that this is there are folks across the country who are, who are dialing in is that there are ARP state and volu staff and volunteers in every state willing to partner with you. So quickly, um, our age friendly network is one of is that framework that I mentioned. It is a five year voluntary framework for jurisdictions and states to evaluate their communities from the perspective of housing, transportation, built environment, and more to see how they're faring, how are they doing um, in, in ensuring that those work for older adults. And more importantly, it's a framework for action. Um, it begins with listening. It begins with creating diverse coalitions. And I think everybody on this call understands that advocacy needs to be rooted in, in understanding the needs and building diverse coalitions. Um, and the degree to which many of our age-friendly communities overlap with complementary programs, such as grants from the CDC on active transportation, such as the Bicycle Friendly Communities Program and Dementia Friendly Community Programs, other things like that. It's all a way of saying that there are these, uh, these would-be partnerships on the table that can be had by exploring your needs through an age-friendly lens. So I certainly encourage you to use our map to find out if you reside in a community that is an age-friendly network member. Um, as I mentioned, we run a grant program annually and we're in, right in the middle of the open season for applications this year. Uh, our community challenge grant program will award about $2 million this year in quick action grants that are meant to help communities make the case and demonstrate new techniques that can be um, leveraged for, for better accessibility, for better quality of life for people of all ages, all abilities. Um, these grants typically are made in public space and transportation arenas, so very well suited to the discussion we're having today. Um, and encourage you to think about applying. In the past, they've been used for things like crosswalks and bike racks, public art, um, ciclovia events, bicycle education, uh, and much more. Uh, so that window is open now. It closes April 14th. More information can be had at aarp.org slash livable. Um, and again, one of the, you know, a couple of the ways that, that we talk about here um, in terms of, we've seen grants in the past, I should say, that very clearly focus on how we can think differently about our existing infrastructure and make it more accessible. We've made a number of grant awards uh, in the past that speak to how do we build an accessible seating um, into our public spaces? How do we expand our, our trails and paths to ensure that they work for people of all abilities? How do we build in signage um, that works better for people with, with memory issues or, um, uh, or dementia? And so that they too can enjoy our public spaces. So a lot of really good um, creation, creativity and innovation has come forward through that challenge grant program and we encourage you to apply this year too. A couple other tools I want people to be aware of um, our wonderful livability index, which lets you understand and evaluate or ascertain in your community how well you're doing from a livability standpoint. Every community is listed there uh, and, and it gives you kind of a starting point for, for action. 
Um, we also invite you to check out our livable interactive map, which lets you identify past community challenge grants, as well as itch friendly network members in your state, in your region. And then I think the most important takeaway here might be, uh, in addition to the grant dollars, um, our newsletter, which is uh, comes out just about every Wednesday. It, it is focused on practitioners, local leaders and practitioners, reaches about 110,000 people now every week, and really encourage you to sign up for this, this free newsletter that's full of resources, ideas, uh, and, and announcements. Uh, another of the resources that I, I hope many of you are already aware of are our free publications. I think perhaps our, well, we may be best known for our walk audit, which is a frequently cited tool um, used by bike and pet advocates to get community members out evaluating their, their neighborhood. So that's just one of the many tools that we offer. We encourage you to explore all of these um, and particularly recommend to you, you know, the fact that we have walk audit worksheets available in English and Spanish. Um, we have a pop-up placemaking guide that we released about a little over a year ago that includes recipes for how to do these temporary demonstrations and much, much more. Um, so please do take a look at those. And again, we'll make those available for free in print or download. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on a few different examples of how uh, our work is happening in communities as a way of kind of painting a picture for what that advocacy, advocating for increased accessibility might look like. So in Tucson, Arizona, for example, they're a member of our age-friendly network. That work, that five-year voluntary program that they're going through now, um, focuses at their request, at their desire, focuses on expanding transportation alternatives, specifically around complete streets, bed and bike, uh, ped and bike safety, uh, safety and, and overall kind of enhancements to make sidewalk and transit more useful for, for, for people with, with differences in how they get around. Um, and there are a number of different programs that they've brought in to help them accelerate work in that arena, one of which was um, bringing in a service year volunteers to help them um, uh, get open streets activities, to get Ciclavia events up and running, even uh, despite COVID in this last year. Miami-Dade County is another jurisdiction I think that is very, um, it, it paints a picture of how other communities can follow suit. So they've been a member of our network for a few years now, as well as several jurisdictions within that county. Again, their plan focuses very intensively, very purposefully on, on transportation, how to make pedestrian safety, um, how to improve pedestrian safety, how to improve walkability, how to provide better driver education for older adults and promote public transit use. One of the things that they identified was that older adults have a difficult time taking buses because of the heat, because of lack of places to, to sit, um, lack of shade coverings, in addition to sort of those barriers that might exist in terms of familiarity. So one of the resources that they tapped into was our Community Challenge Grant Program. Uh, they were able to construct these, what they call age-friendly benches at transit stops in the county um, last year, a couple of years ago. And finally, Columbus, Ohio is another one of our age-friendly network members. Um, Columbus has done a whole bunch of work in this arena, but specifically in transportation, they've really, I think, done some fantastic work to put in place new transportation, uh, new neighborhood transportation uh, circulator buses to complete a safe routes to age in place study with the state DOT. Um, and, and one of the programs I think is so interesting is this partnership program between Villages, which is a private member-based uh, service delivery mechanism, if you will, um, that helps people age in place. They've paired those villages with Lyft so that when villages are unable to, to, to provide volunteer driver offerings, uh, that the members of those villages can, can tap into Lyft. And those Lyft drivers have already been trained on how to better help and support older adults or people with disabilities. Um, so those are just a few of the examples, lots more information on our website and happy to take questions and uh, engage in the conversation at the end as well. That was great. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Susan, do you want to go? You're on mute still. That won't work at all, will it? Um, I'm Susan Dua, Executive Director of Center for Independence of the Disabled in New York, Sydney. And I want to thank Transportation Alternatives and also thank my colleagues who've gone before me and made intriguing statements about opportunities for new technology and opportunities for voluntary action to bring about a more livable landscape and transportation sphere. I want to offer you a perspective from the disability community um, that 
has benefited from more than 40 years of advocacy on transportation and the streetscape for people with disabilities, aiming to remove barriers to full and equal access for people with disabilities. I uh, am going to begin by telling you that anyone can acquire a disability. People acquire disabilities as a result of birth, disease, workplace hazard. If they're like me, they have a traffic collision. I was hit by a taxi and I now have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, sometimes people acquire disabilities simply by the process of aging. People have difficulty seeing difficulty hearing, difficulty picking up their feet, moving their legs, fatigue while standing or walking, uh, lack of balance, all of those things. Disability prevalence rates differ in different communities. And so I'm glad that Danielle brought up inequities. Um, disability prevalence rates are much higher among people who are black and people who are gay lesbian or bisexual, according to the existing literature. Um, people with disabilities are far more likely to be living deep in poverty on a long-term basis. In New York City, the rate of people living below 100% of the federal poverty level is 36%. That's very, very, very much higher than for people with no disability. And approximately 58% of people with disabilities are living below 200% of the federal poverty level. So as we look at solutions, we need to be looking at very low income people who may not have access to all of the technological solutions that we may think would be appropriate for them at this juncture. Um, I want to mention as well that our disabilities may be visible or not visible. Uh, people with disabilities uh, are often thought of also as people who are needing assistance when in reality, we're very much capable of contributing to creating a more livable community for all. Uh, we are neither pitiable in this nor heroic. We just want to be part of an open community that includes all of us. Uh, people with disabilities should be able to participate fully in all that life has to offer rather than being segregated or excluded. Uh, disability civil rights laws have long reinforced the right to equal access and place an affirmative obligation on public accommodations to remove barriers to access for people with disabilities. Um, we have long been involved in uh, removing barriers as an agency. We have worked on all kinds of issues in the community and very much particularly on open spaces and on transportation systems. And this is because inaccessible transportation systems and inability to use public thoroughfares is a key barrier to education, to employment, to healthcare, to social integration. Uh, and it results in gross disparities between people with and without disabilities in all of these areas and gross inequities for people with disabilities. Campaigns to create accessible transportation that we're involved with usually begin by community surveys. We begin by documenting the barriers that people are experiencing and reporting to us, something like what Danielle was talking about. And we do training for people with disabilities to go out and examine the streetscape, examine the sidewalks, examine how livable in Danielle's terms our community is. We then um, involve people who are affected and we invite them to talk about how they're affected by these barriers. We organize testimony in order to bring these issues to the public, to policymakers, to reporters and the media. We are very interested also in pressing our point home. And so we're willing to organize demonstrations together with allies and uh, attempt in working with public authorities to negotiate successful, successful settlement solutions that can bring some of the problems we identify to resolution. Um, however, sometimes it's been necessary to, to rely upon civil rights laws at the federal, state and local level 
to press our point home when all efforts at public education, at negotiation, at creating better understanding have seemingly failed. Um, we have achieved a great deal through this process that we've engineered over many years. And uh, for example, the physical accessibility of buses is as a result of a campaign by the disability community that involved demonstrations and then ultimately litigation to bring about uh, lifts on buses. We also advocated for marking of subway edges so that people who are blind would not fall off edges of the subway as our staff were known to do on occasion and risk their lives as a consequence. We uh, were successful in winning that, although that's still a work in progress. We did a campaign to make the taxi system more accessible and won an agreement that was to make 50% of the taxi system accessible for people who use wheelchairs um, by a date certain. Sadly, that agreement has not been fulfilled by the city. Uh, advocacy, our advocacy campaign has resulted in public-private partnerships to install subway elevators where building is being done. And we've supported those campaigns through the city planning process. We're interested now in changing zoning to permit more subway elevator building. Um, the law says that every time a, a new staircase is built or a staircase is renovated or a major renovation is undertaken, federal law requires that an elevator be put in. And so we're looking forward to seeing more renovation on that score. Um, while we appreciate the good intentions of the MTA, uh, we attempted discussions with them which failed. And so we've been forced to go to court pursuant to New York City human rights law to bring about an agreement to achieve the full accessibility to the fullest extent feasible within the shortest time frame possible through uh, litigation or we hope negotiation and a settlement agreement. We also uh, are negotiating for access to bus lanes for paratransit vehicles, taking a paratransit ride, which is supposed to be a substitute for subway accessibility, but is um, certainly not, uh, is very slow. You can take a four hour bus ride to get 20 minutes from your house. And this causes people to miss their job interviews, to be late for work, to fail to attend community meetings, to be unable to attend gatherings of family and friends and so on. So we're looking forward to seeing um, on-demand paratransit services and also faster paratransit services in addition to full subway accessibility. We're very interested in the streetscape and improvements we can bring about in terms of the streetscape. We did a study, a disability person-fueled study of every street corner in Manhattan. We fanned out all across the city after training with a tool that was created based on the Department of Justice guidelines about what curb cuts should look like at corners or at other junctures. And we found, of course, that most of the corners in the city are not legally compliant with federal law and that many of them are in fact dangerous and that that's why people who use wheelchairs or canes often tip over into the street, into the path of traffic because there is a, a deep hole at the end of the curb cut or because the curb cut is so steep, we call it a suicide ramp. All of these issues need to be addressed and that's why we went to court to see that they're addressed. We won an agreement that will bring about fully compliant curb cuts citywide by a date certain. Unfortunately, as a consequence of COVID-19, the Department of Transportation has uh, invoked uh, force majeure and is saying that they, they can't move forward 
with that agreement to make curb cuts accessible, sadly. Um, so we'll see about that. We've been raising concerns for some time about city owned vehicles being parked on sidewalks. If you go near any court, court building, if you go near any police station, any firehouse, you see that the sidewalks are blocked um, every day by vehicles on those sidewalks, making them impassable for people who use walkers, wheelchairs, or other devices, or have difficulty with balance. People are forced then to ride or to walk in the streets in competition with bikes and cars, which is, as we know, very dangerous, proven to be very dangerous. We've been supporting the installation of crossing lights that emit a sound to let people know when they can safely cross the street if they cannot see the light. We've been raising concerns about how pedestrians, how wheelchair users, how people who use canes or walkers or are simply unsteady or have difficulty lifting their feet uh, or moving quickly can coexist with bikes and cars. Uh, we have supported making the streets narrower so that crossing time can be more meaningful for people as they attempt to cross the streets. We have uh, concerns about new street designs because they reduce the predictability of crossing the street. If the bike lane isn't where you last found it, but is now on the other side of a lane of parked cars and you have limited vision or you are blind, how do you know where you are relative to moving traffic and moving bikes? Uh, so we see more work to do in the future as we become um, more reliant on bicycles and other vehicles as well as cars. Um, we are very concerned about the issue of pedestrian and bike rider coexistence in our streetscape. Uh, people on my board of directors, people who work for me, people that we serve citywide and last year we reached through all of our programming, about 80,000 people in New York City, people contact us and tell us that they have been hit by a bike. Having been hit by a car, which is, I'm sure, much worse, um, I understand nonetheless that hitting, being hit by a bike can destroy your chair, can knock you down, can break your hip, um, and can cause other problems, and that we need to find ways of peaceful coexistence together, because we do welcome the opportunity for bikes to be part of our environment. Uh, we do uh, very much support the use of our streets, by the way, to spur the local economy. We very much want to see local small businesses survive COVID-19. We're very concerned about this because small business is often the engine of jobs for people with disabilities. And uh, so we have been encouraged initially to see small businesses taking to sidewalks and streets to bring their business to pedestrians. And uh, however, our support for this has been tempered since it became obvious that the expansions uh, have not been made accessible for people with disabilities. Either there are no ramps into the business area or there are no safe ramps, they're too steep, they're too short, they cause you to bump into chairs, or they are um, interfering with access to curb cuts. I've seen planters placed at the top of a curb ramp so that if you get to the top of that curb cut in your wheelchair or with your walker, you cannot turn safely because you're turning on your side. You're not turning on level ground. Uh, so these are a few of the issues that we would like to negotiate, negotiate out. We're excited about more plazas, but we have questions about the placement of planters, tables, chairs, and other objects in the path of travel and how that might affect people in both positive ways, because we like benches for people who have fatigue 
And we like the opportunity to sit at tables outside with our friends. Um, but we're also concerned that cluttering the path of travel can have very negative consequences and make public spaces very foreboding rather than very welcoming. Uh, we, we hope that all of these issues can be resolved and we look forward to be part of, part of the resolution. Um, we hope to be involved in the planning stages because we can tell you that retrofitting environments where decisions have been made without respect to people with disabilities or older people are very hard to retrofit. It's much easier to plan a universally accessible environment than it is to retrofit one that people are now dedicated to that is entirely exclusionary. Um, so throughout our years of advocacy, we've had wonderful support from allies all across the community in helping us to bring about a more accessible, more transparent city. And we too hope to bring about a more bike-friendly city. We hope to bring about a more public place friendly city. And uh, we certainly hope that uh, civil rights concerns will not be subordinated to other concerns as we go about doing this. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to your questions and looking forward to having a much more inclusive transportation system and streetscape in our future. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to hear from you now. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate all that really helpful information. Uh, so the, the first question I have is for everyone here on the panel. What's the top issue or biggest challenge for those with dis disabilities or with older adults that advocates and elected officials aren't talking about. And I just pasted it in the chat for, for everyone as well. The Anyone? biggest one. Well, uh, the biggest problem within the disability community is the lack of an accessible subway station. Um, you know, people have been talking about it, but discussion has fallen away. And uh, that's extremely unfortunate. Buses are no substitute for an accessible transportation system. Uh, no one is talking about bus routes that are declining. And very often those bus routes are declining in areas where there are a lot of seniors buildings, where there are a lot of buildings where people with disabilities live in greater numbers. And the elimination of those routes is creating transportation deserts for the people who have the least resources and the people who are most likely to need public transportation. Uh, so those are a couple of things. The creation of public malls, no one is thinking about what that means in the absence of uh, accessible public transportation for people who then have been forced to use a car in order to park by their house because they don't have the ability, agility, uh, stamina, to walk from around the block or to walk from transportation to get to their home or to get to their doctor's office or their job. So what will happen to people who have placards in those environments? And what will we do all together to bring about a consciousness about creating a universally accessible landscape? What will we do so that people prioritize that and think that that benefits us all? Parents with strollers, travelers with suitcases, delivery people with bikes and carts. These are all important issues that are not being considered in a robust way in um, public media right now. Yeah, I, I, if I can go next, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what Susan said. And I think I actually have two answers to the question, one of which is kind of rooted in the nexus of what Susan was talking about, which is, I think one of the biggest problems that older adults aren't, uh, sorry, that elected officials aren't fully cognizant of is, is the lack of engagement of older adults in planning and decision making. I think mm -hmm. particularly in light of COVID-19, things have shifted online. We now do Zoom public meetings. We now do email updates, we do announcements to, to, uh, to websites. 
Well, a lot of older adults are not wired. They do not have right. high-speed internet in their homes. They do not have smartphones. They are getting their information from radio, newspaper, friends and neighbors, although that's all obviously diminished in, in time as well, and the phone. I mean, the landline phone, an actual landline phone is many, many people's primary mode of, of, con of uh, communication still. And I know that's shocking to a lot of people, but it is. Um, so you know, the, the reality is that we need those kind of low tech, frankly, a little more tedious ways of getting the news out to every member of our community and making sure that we have ways to include them in the process. You know, we have a lot of very important decisions coming down the pike in terms of fiscal budgets and service delivery you know, Susan mentioned uh, ridership and lines shifting. Um, those are decisions that impact older adults' lives in myriad ways and older adults need to make sure their voices are heard in that. So that's one bucket of answer I have. The other bucket that is something that I think, I, I remain stridently believing that this is the biggest untold story is the, the, um, the effect of natural disasters and extreme weather events on older adults. I think there's an absolute lack, there's a blind spot um, when it comes to local officials and emergency management um, uh, officials in terms of how older adults can respond and need to respond to, to um, those, uh, those events. Think about something as simple as an evacuation order. Well, what is to be made of, of uh, how is one to evacuate if they do not drive, if they do not have access to, to reliable transportation systems? Uh, what is to be made of uh, people who are asked to move to shelters, but they can't because they are tied to either machinery that they need for health reasons, or they're tied to a pet who frankly is their lifeline and cannot be hosted at the shelter and lots of other reasons. I just think there's a huge blind spot in terms of um, that mode of work. And I realize that's a little different than transportation, but it's related um, in terms of what older adults need to be, uh, how they need to be contemplated better and served better by local officials. Just, just to round things out, I mean, I totally concur with my co-speakers and co-panelists. Um, you know, just two, um, two thoughts. You know, I really like Susan's uh, concept of transportation deserts. You know, I think right now we live in an age, um, you know, the fourth technological revolution where there are a lot of accessibility solutions and there are some areas I would call them out of technological mountains, but then there are always these valleys as well. And, 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 and you know, that's a big, big problem. And we really need to audit these areas and figure out how to bridge these problems. And you, you can't have, you know, I, I, I'm going to leave this city out of it. It's not New York City. There's some other city where I went to, I was advising for a blind nonprofit and they spent so much money connecting part of the city with this infrastructurally based localization solution. They were so proud of it and they had all these visually disabled pedestrians using it. And they realized they could only get to this one part of the city and they couldn't get them anywhere else in the city. So it was like you had this one little area and they were just stuck in this one area and they wanted to go everywhere else. And then by the time they figure out how to do it, guess what? It wasn't compatible because the technology had leapfrogged over that technology, right? So the other big issue was forward compatibility. And we need to be really in tune with this. And so I think, you know, the mountain and valley issue and then forward compatibility are kind of the two things that I would highlight. And it's really, really important to think about these things because I've also been advised, I've been asked to advise on projects and before they even get the projects off the ground, they're already having issues with the technology while they're installing the technology. And this is such a big, big problem at the city level. If we're gonna spend $10 million on something and before we even get it to see the light of day, it's already dead. Um, is that so much, you know, you know, so much money that can go to good use. And so um, I think planning is vital in all of this. And, you know, thinking about, you know, both bridging mountain and valley and also forward compatibility is really, really vital. So I'll leave it there because I'm sure we have other questions, but. Thanks so much everyone. Um, here's a, another question for all the panelists. Many transit agencies are unfortunately dragging their feet um, when it comes to implementing ADA requirements. Uh, we talked about subway stations a little bit. That's definitely a part of it. Uh, while we continue to put pressure on the city to be in com compliance, what are other things we can do to in increase accessibility and the, 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 at, at the same time as that pressure campaign? Uh, yes, I, I agree with you entirely. Uh, it is going to be a long process to bring the MTA and uh, Department of Transportation uh, New York City Transit Authority into compliance. Right now, we have some opportunities to try to preserve the on-demand pilot that exists in um, Accessoride and the paratransit program. 
um, which is always under threat of elimination. We need to preserve it because we need to learn from it and try and expand it so that people with disabilities can ride just like everyone else. And um, we need to be bringing up the issue of accessible subways. Uh, contact, contact us at, city, at Sydney with your story about what it means to you not to be able to get around the city. What does it mean to you, uh, you know, if you're working or if you're not able to get a job? What does it mean to you when you miss classes or you couldn't meet with family because you couldn't get there from here? Um, it's important to keep the issue before the media and so to be encouraging the media with letters to the editor to be talking about these topics, uh, to really create a forum ourselves for these topics. Uh, those are a few things that we can do now. And as we move forward with campaigns around zoning for more subway elevators, we'll be letting uh, the world know. Check us out on our Facebook page and our website, www.sydney.org. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Anyone else want to speak on this? Go ahead. Yeah. Danielle, go ahead. Thanks, John. I was about to offer to you. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say, I, yeah, there are, there are opportunities to improve and ex accelerate accessibility in other modes as well. The things that came to mind as Susan was talking, I agree with, with everything she said. Um, was, you know, again, just going back to this sort of pedestrian environment, right? I mean, the, the story you told about curb cuts and, and evaluating corners, I think is fascinating and probably widespread that, you know, communities could very easily find that sidewalk widths are, are not adequate or that they're not well enough maintained. I mean, if you have tree incurs incursions of tree roots or potholes or broken cement, that's a huge risk factor for older adults um, as well as people with disabilities using that infrastructure. So. That is one thing, is just ensuring that your sidewalks work, that they're adequate and that they're well-maintained. Um, and then also when you think about the sort of, I think of the next lowest technology is, is bicycling. Like with the advent now of e-bikes and adult trikes and things like that, there's so many different permutations of bicycles that have made it possible for people of all abilities or, or more abilities um, to use bikes as a viable alternative to transportation. I think that the more that we could do to sort of normalize those kinds of models, um, create parking that accommodates a trike, not just a narrow bicycle, those little time, those little fixes and tweaks can really send a signal about accessibility, how we value it in all modes of transportation. Yes, I mean I totally agree with my co-speakers and co-panels, you know, co um, co-speakers and panels. Again, you know, I, I would just add a couple of quick things, you know, the. The, in, in terms of the city, I mean, we have an old city that we're dealing with with a really old transit system, right? So I think some city agencies are trying their best to deal with just a really antiquated system. I mean, even if you look at the infrastructure they're dealing with, I, I mean, it's like horse and buggy era, right? I mean, we have some old, we have some old infrastructure that they're trying to improve. And so, uh, you know, these are big, 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 big problems. And, you know, the way I would like to think about it, just in terms of Occam's razor, very simple, is we have kind of our infrastructurally based solutions we have our infrastructure free solutions and i think we have hybrid options and you know infrastructure base is great i think you know universal design is fantastic i totally agree with susan's uh prior remarks but that takes a lot of planning and a lot of resources where we have kind of blank canvases and we don't always have that opportunity so we have to make those ambitious goals and plan for that but at the, sa at the same time i think we have to think hybrid and empower the end user with better tools and so mm -hmm. if we can get those solutions to those end users, then we can really empower them um, uh, to really what I consider um, have sensory augmentation um, and really get them through transit systems uh, in a superior manner, in a safer manner. Um, whether you have cognitive decline, whether you have you know, visual disability or you know, whether you're hearing impaired, you know, we can, we're now at a point where we can have you know, book bags that have you know, superior spatial perception for you and give you kind of a heads up of, of some type of ominous threat. And you know, th this is what we need right now in 2021 to help you navigate through a very dynamic living and breathing city ecosystem. And I think if we stand behind some of these tools, we're gonna be in really good shape with some of the, with some of the new infrastructure elements to support what our, um, what our citizens need. 
John, if I might, Marion, um, I'm always so excited by what you're saying, and I'm looking forward to what we can do, uh, both with the blank canvas and with the overbuilt canvas. I have to disagree with you. I know that other cities with old infrastructures are far, far ahead of New York City in terms of accessibility of their subway systems, and if they can do it, so can we. But I agree with you that technology will play a role and we need to find a way past the technology divide that older people and people with disabilities experience, where in part because of poverty, in part because of complexity and lack of education, we have large communities of people with disabilities and older people who do not have internet, who do not have smartphones, who do not use apps, who do not have technology. And there's a, there's a green screen, and then there's uh, the opportunity to adapt as well. Yeah. Um, right, thanks, S Susan, and thanks everyone. Um, this is a question for Danielle. Oh, you already got it in the uh, chat. Um, okay, in that case, and I'll just go ahead to well, the next step. If I could, okay. I, mean, I want I, I put a partial answer in here in part because I don't have an answer on all of it. The question was, how can people in communities find out uh, the relative share of, of older adults without smartphones, without access to a computer? Um, the, the link that I put in the chat, and if, if not everyone can see the chat, it's an FCC broadband map. You can um, search it's broadbandmap.fcc.gov. I will say that is not a perfect tool. I've heard criticisms about how it, in fact, measures accessibility. Um, if one block, for example, has one home that is served by internet, it notes the whole block as being served by internet, which is obviously not the case. Nevertheless, it is a it is a national resource that is a good starting point um, and identifies your cable providers, which can let you dig deeper in terms of coverage. Um, I don't have a great answer on smartphone coverage, and, and I, I don't know how to answer that question, to be perfectly honest. But um, again, I would encourage you, if you're not in, in the DC, if you're not in the New York area, if you are outside, um, you know, think about if there's an age-friendly community in your region, and I would get in touch with that leadership and see if they've asked and answered that question, because they may have uniquely uh, localized answers on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, D Danielle. Appreciate it. Um, so going along, the other thing I wanted to ask, with COVID testing and vaccines have, hi have highlighted how inaccessible transportation is for people with dis disabilities and pre presented hurdles for care for some of the most vulnerable populations. What can we learn from this in order to create real change? I'm, I, I'm delighted that this has come up. I couldn't be more pleased. There are a number of things that can be done. Um, a number of years ago, we had a phenomenon in New York City called Hurricane Sandy. And we had a lot of people, particularly uh, very low income people, more likely to be black and brown people who are older and who had disabilities who were unable to evacuate. And uh, the more accessible modes of transportation were shut down before the subway. And because the subway wasn't accessible and people couldn't get to it, they were absolutely without recourse in terms of evacuation. Uh, after that, we reached a settlement agreement with the city, a landmark court decision, um, which held that the city had to make disaster planning inclusive. And one of the things that flowed from that is that the city was required to do an inventory of city-owned vehicles. And the city now has an inventory of city-owned vehicles that could be used to get people to vaccination sites. In addition, for nearly a year now, I've been advocating and some of my colleagues have been advocating for um, vaccination sites to be put on site at seniors buildings, at buildings where there are concentrations of people with disabilities of very low income people in um, black and Latino communities, particularly because we're more concentrated in these communities and not having to travel would be a real boon also, there are plenty of people who need home visits. And after a year of advocacy, the mayor finally announced that we're gonna be getting a system of home visits. Advocacy works, guys, gotta keep it up. 
But these are some opportunities for people with disabilities who face barriers to vaccination to address those barriers if the city has the will to do so. And we can help create that will. Yeah. I, I would only add, I mean, I totally agree. I think it's, uh, all, all those are fantastic. I think that the disaster planning and management is, is vital. Um, uh, you know, within the, the home visits, I think partnerships with operations like visiting nurse service, VNS is key. And so, you know, to be very concrete and, delin and to delineate what we need, uh, partnerships with existing operations that could handle the volume that we would need, I, I, I think are critical. So um, um, I'll just mention uh, that as a, a kind of a, a tail end there, but. I'm going to sound like a stuck record a little bit here because I, I really do think that this is both emblematic and indicative of, of the opportunity that in, comes from bringing older adults into the planning sphere again with regards to disaster planning with regards to emergency preparedness. Um, but also, I would argue that having these kinds of coalitions in place that are thinking about the needs of older adults in in, in sunny sky conditions. Um, such as our age friendly communities and the work that they're doing every day, I think those kinds of um, commitments and those kinds of partnerships that already exist really carry the day um, in these moments. We know that in the early days of COVID-19, our age-friendly communities were involved in, in pivoting all of their work from, you know, driving people to doctor's appointments to delivering food and medications. Um, they were able to sort of keep people engaged and informed about COVID by, again, uh, you know, creating phone trees and, and friendly, friendly phone call programs to keep people informed, keep people in touch. Um, and that same, I would say nimbleness or um, you know, agility has, has borne out now to where we're seeing age friendly communities trying to play the role of educating older adults in what is going on. It is such a murky world, it's so confusing. And right now we just did a quick like pulse poll of our age friendly communities recently and learned that that is where they see their greatest service right now is just informing people about how to sign up for a vaccine, what it means to get a vaccine, what to do after a vaccine, the risks of not getting a vaccine. A secondary smaller group was actually involved in transportation to and from vaccine sites, which again, to Susan's point, great of great importance as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so, so much for everyone for those answers. So going back a little bit to this question of Zoom and technology, uh, a lot of communities across the country have converted to Zoom to do political work, whether it's community board meetings or town halls. And we've touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if everyone could elaborate. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages to older adults and those with disabilities and trying to use this technology to access space? Um, have there been any kind of positive gains or has, has the bulk of it made things less accessible? We, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we've seen that um, people with disabilities are flocking to public hearings and public meetings uh, and attending on Zoom when they have the technology. And we think that creates an environment in which public discourse is happening that is much richer because then our community has a chance to comment, has a chance to be seen to care about the issue. And if we're not seen as caring about the issue, then we become, we are left invisible and no one will care about our concerns. But it's a double-edged sword. Uh, two, it, people don't have to get transportation. That's a great thing. Uh, people don't have to go out in the cold in winter. And when snow blocks curb cuts and streets, they don't have to go out to go to a hearing or a public event. But for those people without the technology, it's an absolute blank. The public sphere is empty for them. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Susan again. <laughs> We're very much on the same page here. Um, I agree, double-edged sword. I think, you know, one of the things that we've seen be successful, and again, in our age-friendly communities that are really intentional about this, is that recognizing that while it opens the door to, for more people to be involved in the way that's been described, it doesn't include everyone. And so what some of our age-friendly communities have done is take those um, Zoom meetings and those recordings and rebroadcast them through other means, public access television, 
again, good old fashioned radio programs. Like we have seen a lot of people connect the dots between what's happening in our virtual decision-making sphere right now and these low tech or more conventional means as a way of at least in keeping people apprised of what's happening and then making sure that there's a backdoor for, um, for involvement, whether it's writing a letter or uh, you know, submitting a paper survey or something like that. Like let that Zoom meeting not be the only chance that local leaders get to hear from people, keep that window open, keep that door open so that, so frankly, there is kind of like a no wrong door way of, of getting people's voices heard. Yeah, I, I totally agree as well. The only thing I'll highlight is that I think some of these platforms, there are a whole lot of virtual platforms these days, not all of them are accessible. And the ones that are accessible, unfortunately, they're not, the, the accessible infrastructure is not accessible to those who need it. So, you know, in some extent there needs to be education as well and this education needs to be um, end user friendly. Uh, and um, I think we need to give some thought to that. Um, you know, there needs to be um, a lot more outreach on some of these topics. Um, you know, the, the, the enriched discourse is fantastic. I totally agree. And um, uh, we just need to spend more time thinking about them and, and perhaps thinking about best practices in some of these virtual meetings. Right, you're so right. Are the vaccine sites all accessible? Do they meet accessibility standards? I go to so many uh, public agency meetings, city of New York agency meetings that are not accessible. And they don't have captioning, they don't have an interpreter, they don't have means of participation um, for so many people. And it's really unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, thanks so much. This is a question for JR, um, in your work around technology and innovation, what are some of the common pathways to seeing um, an, an idea or a project you worked on get implemented? Does it start with the funding and then implementation and then imp 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 implementation and then a widespread ad adoption? Could you walk us through the process of seeing your um, ideas get um, adopted? Well, that's complicated. There are a lot of different models and paths, but, you know, I, I guess I'll give a for instance, uh, you know, one is, you know, potentially going after some seed funding. And so, you know, even Danielle mentioned through AARP, there's some great opportunities for grants. And so we look for opportunities from foundations for new ideas. Um, and then we try and get some, uh, you know, initial key money to develop a concept. Uh, and then usually we use that um, uh, from a preliminary standpoint to go after federal money or sometimes state money. Um, so we have a portfolio that includes money from uh, the FTA, so the Federal Transportation Authority, also some National Science Foundation money, so NSF. We've also been supported by the National Institutes of Health, um, so NIH. Um, and so, you know, before we go after the federal money, we try and go after the little money. And then really the, the, the fastest path to get something commercialized is through some type of a partnership with another commercial entity. So, you know, can you end up developing something and then getting a license to someone who already knows how to do it or has, you know, um, you know, products that are out there on the marketplace and has the operations and the sales and everything else in place. So they have the engine ready to go. And you could say, you know, here's what we're developing. Here are our concepts. You know, we can demo this for you. We have these stages called technology readiness levels. Uh, was originally developed in the 70s by NASA. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you Google it. It's a nice infrastructure and a framework. Um, and then uh, we assess where we are in terms of maturity, and then you can start developing some, some partnerships. But there, there are lots of different models. Um, and I think some academic medical centers do this better than others. Uh, I think NYU excels um, at, at this, but uh, um, yeah, uh, happy to take more questions on that. But I think um, in the interest of time, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Um, here's another question for all the, the, the panelists. Um, it's generally seen as unacceptable for a street to be blocked or to have potholes while a sidewalk can uh, very commonly falls into disrepair. How can we elevate sidewalks to the same level of importance as, as streets, given that uh, the sidewalks are very often used by older adults and those with dis dis disabilities? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on this one if that's okay. Um, I, I one of the wonderful things about AARP, there are many, uh, is that we have these 53 state offices. I mentioned one in every state plus DC, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And what I have been uh, stunned to learn is the the wide variety in perspectives at the very hyper local level 
um, about sidewalks. So there are communities where they purposely do not want sidewalks to be constructed because of the liability that that means for the city to maintain and repair in the future. So they're making a budget claim that we can't possibly afford to have sidewalks because it costs too much to maintain and clear them. Um, you know, you see homeowner associations that have very variable um, policies around sidewalks um, that often represents thousands of homes that, you know, fall under an entirely different ju jurisdiction than the rest of the community because it's on private land. Um, the, 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 the disconnect and, and, and understanding about sidewalks is to me stunning, especially when it literally takes pedestrians out of the path of dangerous 2000 pound <laughs> vehicles that otherwise could crush them. So it, it, in my mind, it is, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, Paul, you've made the exact point. A bunch of homeowners complaining about sidewalks being installed. Exactly. Um, we, we've seen that in other places too. How do we remedy that? Again, I'll just go, I, I, I know I sound like a stuck record, but I really think that um, when you're able to make the case that, uh, you know, there will come a day when all of us will not be able to, to drive, right? If we're lucky to get old enough, <laughs> to become old enough where we cannot drive anymore, we will need to at least be able to walk outside our front door to get a little exercise uh, to, 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 uh, to stay healthy. Uh, you know, you're, you, all of us, many of us, have aging relatives um, that is in that plight now. Bring those stories to your local official. Put it in terms they understand. Um, obviously, you know, young children walking to school, nobody wants to read stories. Nobody wants to hear of, of accidents happening um, for kids. And yet, and yet we see traffic congestion worsening on our streets. We know there's a need to get cars off the street. Um, and, and here sidewalks are designed for that express purpose. Um, I will just do one more plug here for our walk audit, which I do think is a very helpful tool. And I, I, I don't know that it got put in the chat, but I can do that. Um, the tool is a very useful way of, of bringing a group of people together, get your civic association, bring, invite your mayor or your council member um, and do a walk audit of a neighborhood and help them see through the eyes of a, of a pedestrian, particularly a pedestrian with, with uh, mobility issues, how well or not well that infrastructure is working for them and then build a case around that. Um, anyone else on this point uh, before I go on to the last question? Um, I would just say well said and I would add that as I understand it, there's now technology that can be used to map sidewalks where there are sidewalks that are broken or have potholes and uh, other hazards uh, in New York City, I believe that technology is now in use to identify sidewalk hazards. And so it's not out of reach. And thanks to the kind of technological innovation that John Ross is talking about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so this is the uh last thing I wanted to ask, what is one thing you hope all part participants take away from this panel and what are some solid action slash next steps we can all take to advocate for a change? Uh, JR, do you want to start? Sure, I'll start off. I, th I think, you know, the biggest takeaway I I'd like to uh, push for is just empowering the end user uh, with technology. You know, I, I think just in, in 2021, we have so much access, even through mobile technology, but also through new wearables. Um, it's just an exciting uh, new future. Um, and I think we really need to think of hybrid solutions. So not just, uh, you know, constantly in environmental retrofits, or if we don't have the opportunity for that blank canvas, but really empowering the end user. Uh, you know, to really uh, amplify, um, you know, their core sensory capabilities. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're going to have a very, very bright future where everyone with a disability can uh, really imagine and, and see uh, their true superpowers. That's the way I like to see it. Here, here. Uh, create public conversations where you are. Talk with your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, your fellow students. Talk with a guy down the block. Start a conversation with the person in the corner store. Talk about all of these issues and how they affect you. Um, come to Sydney's Facebook page and raise these issues, CIDNY. Come to our website and uh, describe your experiences with streets and sidewalks. 
really elevate the conversation about barriers and barrier removal and how if we work together, we can get it done. And of course, livable cities. Wow, I love it. I, you know, I think AARP is doing a fine job there. So my takeaway is one, um, do a little demographic homework about the community where you live. Find out how, what is the percentage currently of people over 65 who live in your community and look a few years down the road, 10 years down the road, let's say, and find out what that percentage is. I would bet money that that, that that percentage is increasing and take that and use that statistic as the, the forcing function to get local leaders to answer the question, are we ready? And if we're not, what can we do to get ready? Because the great news is that making changes that prepare us for that future help everybody now. People of all ages, all abilities helps everybody now. The second, perhaps more parochial thing I'll, I'll suggest people do is sign up for a newsletter um, because that's a way of just getting constant new information. And we often feed information from partners to that group. So I'll put instructions there in the chat box. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much. We're just about at time. Um, I really want to thank everyone for your time again and for preparing these really informative remarks. Um, please stick around for our, uh, put the uh, next pop up, everyone. So, uh, yeah, have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Bye, everybody.